Welcome to Actions and Limits. My name is Justin Atherton. I'm the Peak Performance Consultant for Confidence Unchained. With me as always is Paul Fortune. Paul is a mindset coach and the founder of A Call to Action. And together, we make Actions and Limits. show the podcast where we talk about the actions we can take and the limits we create make sure to subscribe or like to our youtube channel and follow us on your favorite podcast platform and make sure to reach out via instagram or facebook at actions and limits or send an email to actions and limits at gmail.com to get your questions featured on the show paul i'm excited for our guests this week. He's the partner of Brian Marin, who was on the show last week. So Greg Williams is going to be on the show and uh, we're going to get a a different perspective on, on the business that they're in. And, and I'm, I'm excited to to pick their brains because this is my jam right here, man. Yeah. I I've been following the, the both of them. And like you said, they have different personalities, Brian and Greg, both great personalities, but uh, Greg has a little bit more of a humorous side to him, which I, I, I love, as you know, I love humor. So he has that, that he spreads in, but he also has a strong message that he wants to send to everybody that, that we all should listen to safety. Safety is extremely important. And sometimes you know this better than I do, Justin, because of the field you're in. Sometimes that's not um, top of mind, which should be on the day-to-day basis. So Greg's going to be an important person to bring on. But the the great thing about Greg is he's not going to give it to you like Ben Stein. He has a great personality and he's going to mix it up with you and uh, give you give you that medicine with a little bit of sugar so that uh, so that it's more pleasant to take. I like that. I know I'm excited to talk with them. Um, and, and I think that's important too, to get a message across sometimes. Sometimes you got to break it down and, and throw some, some humor in there. So no, I'm excited to bring Greg out. So let's go ahead and do that, man. So Greg Williams is the former director of human behavior pattern recognition and analysis, irregular warfare for Orbis operations in McLean, Virginia. Previous to that, Greg was the director of human behavior pattern recognition and analysis regular warfare for cubic applications in San Diego, uh, California. And Greg is a decorated veteran urban law enforcement professional and a decorated veteran former soldier with over 30 years of combined experience and expertise. He is an adjunct professor of sociology and has done work for Western State University, San Diego State University, and the University of Southern California, as well as USC's Institute for Creative Technology. Greg is an industry expert in irregular warfare for the defense community and now works with Brian Marin at Arcadia Cognorati. So let's go ahead and welcome out Greg Williams. Well, Greg, we're happy to have you on the Actions Limits podcast, man. So thank you for joining us, brother. Thank you so much, Justin. Uh, Paul, looking forward to talking with both of you. I know we had your partner Brian on last week, and that was a great conversation. And so I'm, I'm looking forward to another amazing conversation and and your background's a, a little bit different than Brian's but you guys you know you know work so well together on this you know human behavior and analyzing this how did how did you come down this path because I know Brian shared that with us last week right. a little bit but how did you end up down this path well I ended up just a inner city kid uh, uh in Detroit with a lot of opportunities and sadly most of them were uh uh, the wrong side. Uh, so what I learned how early on, uh, I, I learned that I had an ability to uh, predict when cops and parents were looking too closely and how to bamboozle them with a, uh, a series of human behavior uh, uh, magic tricks uh, to disappear in plain sight. And it worked perfectly. Uh, that led to uh, judge saying, wouldn't you be much happier in the military or in a jail cell. And I said, you know, the military sounded better. Let's talk. I actually had a primary candidacy to West Point, uh, managed to screw that up in just a couple of months, 17 years old with a uh, soon to, to uh, a pregnant wife, soon to have a child. 
thought there is no place for me in the world. Took a motorcycle from Detroit to Green Bay, Wisconsin, joined the army. Uh, army gave me the structure that I needed. And uh, I used these same tricks in the army to uh, hide or find the enemy. Uh, it's simply sociology, psychology, physiology, and the ability to sense make a situation by taking a look at the baseline that's presented to you and looking within that baseline for anomalies. Came back out, uh, was either going to the you know General Motors or one of the big three in Detroit, uh, or there were police jobs, said, well, hey, what do you know? It's ex exactly the opposite of the uh, side of the coin. Let's try it. And I ended up having a uh, a great uh, affinity for cop work. Ended up making 3,000 felony arrests in my first 10 years on the road using the self same principles I've used now for 40 years. Uh, somewhere in a place, they remind me it's Afghanistan, I kept running into Marin, the bearded wonder, who, uh, if you look closely, looks more like Taliban than most central casting Taliban. And uh, I had run into him a couple of times as a Marine on the West Coast when I was training uh, the Marines in my combat hunter program. And it just seemed uh, that every time we ran into each other was in one of these kinetic war zones where we were trying to uh, save lives on both sides, you know, the civilian and the military and, and coalition force, of course. And finally, uh, I don't know, eight or 10 years ago, I said, Brian, why don't you come work for me? And we've been a team ever since. Greg, I want to take you back a little bit because you said that uh, you had this, this power to read people really well. And you did this at at adolescence because you were able to fool your parents and whoever, H how did you learn this trick? Because it was no, it wasn't training. You learned yeah. it on your own. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm one of those rare, uh, uh, to be absolutely humble. It's not me on the shoulders of giants, uh, God, Buddha, Vishnu, Allah, lightning struck. And I had this ability, you know, it's like if you have uh, 16 ounce gloves in an empty factory, sooner or later, you're going to hit a wall and find an exit. Mm -hmm. Right. So mm -hmm. what happened, I was lucky enough to have a, my, my dad was first Marine Division Raider Battalion back in World War II. I came from a hitting clan. My dad and my mom uh, uh, were fighting all the time. So it was one of those things that I had to know uh, what the ground rules were when I came in the house. You know, is it going to be a fight night? Am I going to get dinner tonight? Am I going to have to run and hide somewhere? So then mm -hmm. all of my friends were, I, I had the rogues gallery of gangsters. And uh, my brother, Brian, who was intellectual in our family, the only kid that was going to go to college that was going to make it big and everything else. And he had the, these kids that were just geniuses all the time. And some of them helped me name that. They said, you know, when you do this, what you're doing is you're channeling this and able to see that. So I started studying on my own and I did a limited objective experiment from the time I was a little kid. I was lucky enough. YMCA around us taught us how to swim and taught us how to fight. Uh, so as I was getting my minnow out and you know, swimming in Lake St. Clair, by the same token, I was doing a Kodagashi on the dojo floor. And I found out that if you could anticipate what that person was about to do, if they uh, uh, demonstrated their intent, then you could block it and not get hit in a snot locker so hard. <laughs> and so little things like that. And then, you know, sadly, I, I you know, we, we stole like CBs and car radios and and uh, back then, there was a thing called a hubcap that was on a car, and you could uh, make some good money for that. And then finally, somebody grabbed me by the scruff of the neck and said, you know, if you only applied yourself, you'd be able to do this well, you know, and, and not have to face going to Dehoko, the Detroit, Detroit House of Corrections. And those influences uh, were the ones that I think are, are behind my 40-some year trek now uh, to describe human behavior pattern recognition and analysis. But you have had even got good grades to be able to get into West Point, correct? So you must have done well in school, right? No, no, the great thing about that is I have learned to connive my entire life. So the idea was that uh, with my father and with a bunch of the other connections that I had uh, through his uh, military and, and police background, uh, I was able to meet a bunch of people that counseled me, son, if you don't go straight, you're going to die in the streets of Detroit. You're going to do this. And so finally, they all said, hey, listen, what is it that you want? And I thought I'd go into military. And they said, well, hey, we'll give you the edge. So every one of them wrote a letter and you know, testified that I could be turned around. The problem is that back then, West Point was an engineering school. There was no such thing as liberal arts at West Point. So they said, would you like to go to the prep school? Beginning and the end, by the way. And I said, of course I'd like to. So I played hockey. So I went up to Northern and uh, didn't attend a class, uh, was, you know, uh, went to a, a, a place called, I think it was Scarlett O'Hara's, ran into my first wife, and the rest is history. I mean, you know, the, the, I was James Dean, but I was a rebel without a clue. Uh, so, uh, and I think many of us are without structure and without direction and distance when we're younger, 
uh, we, you know, uh, uh, we can find the wrong thing. If we're looking for it, we'll, we'll find it. So I was lucky enough to be resurrected by a number of influences in my life that, that pushed me back to the side of right. It is interesting, though, because, you know, figuring out if it's nature versus nurture, like picking up on all these skills, being able to read human behavior. I had to look at that for myself, too, because that's definitely something I'm interested. I know Paul and I have had a lot of conversation about this, learning micro expressions, the, the, the body language, all, all of these clues that help you pick up on stuff early. Right. And I, I think some of the things you talked about were um, ways th that you get taught without really being a church teaching environment parents like a, a rough upbringing like having to deal with dangerous situations and go like yeah. like you said am i going to get fed tonight is there a fight about to happen in the house do i need to freaking take off and um all of those lead to the ability to you know read that human behavior and to be able to keep yourself safe so it's a survival mechanism right to be able to learn yeah, those type of traits and you're spot on, Justin. And one of the things was that my dad didn't have very much formal education, but my dad never was out of a job. And he got blown up real good uh, island hopping for the Marine Corps in a place called Shuri Castle. So he had one leg shorter than the other his entire life. He had shrapnel wounds in his face. When he was shaving, he had to rinse off with Canfo Phonique and pull out metal. And my dad never once uh, uh, said anything about that and said, wow, what a hard life I've got. And it was like, look, if you're not going to school today, you're going to work with me. You know, you're going to be making money. You're not going to be hanging with those kids. Mm -hmm. And I remember one morning I was maybe 10, uh, 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 if anything, because we started early in the house, you know, and uh, we were at a place called uh, Whiteway Hamburgers at eight in Van Dyke in, in Detroit uh, for a quick breakfast on the way to a job site. And breakfast usually meant a cheeseburger and a long neck beer for my old man, cheeseburger and a Coke for the kid. And he would spring for it because it was a buck. And on the way into this place, there was a guy that was walking out and my dad just changed for a minute. And you could see my dad bladed his body. And when a guy walked past, my dad threw a shoulder into him and then said, Hey, you know, sorry about that. And said, Hey, uh, so, uh, you know, what kind of car do you work on? And it, a guy's like, uh, I don't work on cars, dude. I'm in a band. And my dad goes, good, good. And we walked in and I was like, okay, what the hell just happened, dad? You got to come back and you got to get the Rosetta Stone out and show me. And he goes, when a guy came out, he said, I noticed that he had a bulge and it was right where I would carry my gun. And he said, so I was afraid that the guy just robbed the place or was going to rob us. So he said, when I bumped into him, I could feel something hard in this position. And he showed me on the belt and he goes, there's only two people in the world that put their belt buckle off to the side. And he says, it's people who work on cars because they don't want to scratch up a car. And it's guys that, you know, uh, uh, knock the bass around when they're playing in a band. And he said, so that guy's answer was perfect. If you wouldn't have answered one of those, I'd have choked them out. And this is, this was life. These were these little lessons all the time. And so, you know, whether it was in East Detroit, Detroit high school, whether it was on the streets, you know, there, there was this constant bombardment of these incredible lessons. And, and I was just that kid that always glammed down to that and added a, so what, w what's at the end of this, you know, it's sort of like an Aesop fable, everything. I knew when uh, a car was slowing down and pulling up to the curb that they likely weren't asking for directions. It was early signs of a drive-by. Now, mm -hmm. now uh, I think kids that grow up out in the, you know, Kansas and Missouri and whatnot, I think they learn that too. They learn when they walk the uh, fence row before they get to the gate, they kick a, a pheasant and maybe they have lunch. You know, they can shoot that pheasant and take it home. They learn how to talk across the front of a pickup rather than I was learning how to, you know, talk through the peephole and the door at a hotel with a, you know, safety guard on. And, and I think what happens is because we don't pay attention, we miss the golden opportunities that abound everywhere around us. So how do you apply this to, you know, everyday people and everyday life like these, because I think that the level of self awareness that it takes is so key. But yep. to me, there's a, a an overwhelming lack of self awareness with, right. with most people out there. Right. And and these are literally survival tools. So yeah. how do you break this down and, and make people realize how important this stuff is? Now, an, an incredible question. So, so first of all, I stick to what I know. And, and my thing is that I've studied absolutely everybody. I've worked with the greatest minds in our time uh, 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 from the, the people that study psychology and psychopathy and police were clearly let me get behind the velvet rope and 
you know, conduct uh, daily experiments with other human beings. I got to, you know, study with the uh, U.S. Department of Justice, Department of Defense, write these great things and see what worked and what didn't. And then they said, do you think it works in combat? I go, I don't know. And they sent me to combat in Iraq and Afghanistan to, to prove it, right? And so in 53 countries, I've been able to prove uh, all of my theories and most of the theories that other people had. And the problem with their theories is they got some really good stuff, but uh, they put it in a book and they put it on a shelf. They, they never ventured out mm -hmm. to say, hey, what's this like outside of the classroom? And I, I've endeavored my entire life to prove every one of them outside the classroom. And something you said earlier, Justin, when you were talking about body language, we put an inordinate weight on body language. Our brain already understands it. We have uh, electrochemical neurotransmitters that read everything that everybody's saying all the time. We read their facial expressions and we can't do micro facial heat uh, expressions. If we were some sort of Amazon tree frog that, that you know, read at that spectrum about uh, heat sensors, we could do that. But every time I read something about that, I'm skeptical because we were humans and we've been doing it for 10,000s, if not millions of years without the, the benefit of those. A mom knows her own baby. We can read a baby when it's a little kid and doesn't have language. We can tell when it's wet versus when it's hungry. We can tell when it's cranky and sleepy. So these things are within us. And, and for example, that drug would be oxytocin, the love drug, but oxytocin attaches to when a boy falls in love with a girl. And you can tell body language, if I'm going to look for para language, it's how close are they in the pickup truck? If that girl's sitting past her seat belts, do you get what I'm saying? Or they're yeah. walking in a mall and he's got his hand in her pocket and she's got her hand. Uh, if the guy across from me in a bar, I accidentally, you know, uh, uh, shoulder bump him and, and spill his beer. I'm going to buy him another beer because I'm a lover, not a fighter. Uh, but if I see his fist ball up and I see his shoulders coming up and he's showing his teeth, I know those are anger cues. So I'm not going to wait around for his mouth to open. I'm going to knock him out and I'm going to leave. And so those type of <laughs> pre-event cues and indications are around there. And if you're not uh, open to them, if you don't know how to read them, and it's simple stuff like don't park your car uh, in the parking lot close to the front of Target. Uh, that's where a guy that's going to detonate his car or rob the Target is going to park. So take a minute, drive around. It's healthier to park way out. You get what I'm trying to say? And when mm -hmm. you're walking, smell, look, feel, sense, taste. So the whole reason that we got into training, uh, if you understand survival, a bunch of ways to make fire. Uh, one of them is called a bow and a drill. Uh, uh, so when Shelly and I had the, the ranch, we had these kids up in the primitive wilderness, and I was trying to show them all the different ways to make fire. The bow and the drill wore me out. I'm laying on my back. It took like an hour and 45 minutes to use this elk thigh bone and use my shoelace and use these pieces. Of wood. We had all the right components. And I was thinking, if I was really in a survival thing, wouldn't it be nicer to have that Bic lighter. Do you get what I'm trying to say? And, yeah. and the answer is it is nicer to have the big lighter. So you have to learn all these gradations of survival, but the reality is some of them either don't work or so hard that you're not going to use them in a survival situation anyway. So Brian and I, and, and of course the, the rest of our team, what we like to do is go in and say, here's the, the quick down and dirty ways of sense making your environment to know if you're in trouble or not. And there's only two things, most likely course of action, don't have to worry about them. That's the stuff that goes on normally around you. Most dangerous course of action, better take a knee, better give yourself the gift of time and distance, better choose another restaurant or 7-Eleven. And, and life is that simple. Uh, uh, and, and so there's people out there selling programs and there's people out there selling certificates and doing mm -hmm. all that stuff. God bless them. Go, go out there and do it. Uh, we do it for free, webinars, podcasts, all that stuff. And then when we go into train an agency, obviously, because we're spending three or five or 22 days on the ground embedded with them, we got to charge for them. And if people can afford it, we charge them a lot of money. If people can't afford it, we find a way to trade services, the chicken for the bed. Do you get what I'm saying? And we do that. We, we just came back from uh, Liberty University in Virginia. That's why I'm so punchy today. Brian and I flew in late last night. He's in San Diego. Uh, San Diego. I'm here. You know, the people that come to the course were from all over the United States. Some could afford it, some couldn't. So we made it out with liberty that they wouldn't charge any of the students. And we mm -hmm. had law enforcement courts and corrections that came because some of them were smaller agencies. Not every agency is Pennsylvania or Los Angeles or Detroit or, you know, something big like that. And could you imagine that the agency in your jurisdiction can't afford this level of training? That's, that's a crime. Sure. So we're trying to fix that. Sure. You know, uh, Justin has the background in law enforcement, and obviously you have the same background in, in law enforcement. So a lot of this is a lot of this is second nature to the both of you. 
But, you know, when I'm hearing you guys talk and being aware of your surroundings and such, there's a bit, bit of stress that comes over me going, oh, crap, what do I have to look for? This and that. So I, I don't think I'm alone there. I think a lot of people feel that same way. How can you explain that to somebody who isn't, who doesn't have that background, how they can use these tools without being stressed out in every situation? No, no, Paul, and that's the, the best question I've heard in a long time. Here's the thing, okay, if we constantly approach it that we have to be a, a first responder, we have to be a paramedic, we have to be somebody like that. So I had to counsel somebody yesterday, and it was in an airport of, of all places. Uh, their kid uh, is grown up to the point where they're crawling, but they want to walk, so they're lifting them up themselves up on everything. And what they do is they grab the TV tray, and the TV tray fell on a kid, and they had spent all the previous day in the emergency room. So I had to sit down and explain to him basic physics. And I explained it to him with the pan on the stove. And when the handle's over the pan on the stove, the kid looks at that as a point of leverage. You know, three points of contact when you're climbing. I do a lot of parkour, right? And so if you grab that when that oil is hot and you pour it down, uh, you're going to have a horrific situation and you're going to be dealing with that for the rest of your life. So how do we mitigate that? Do we mitigate that at bang? In other words, when I've got my handle on there or when I'm, you know, pulling on that, or do we educate well before that? And my thing is that everything is a teachable moment. Uh, so before you go outside, make sure you shut the lights off in your house. Why? Because you don't want to backlight yourself and have a predator waiting for you outside. You know, uh, uh, something simple like that. You don't have to be a cop to do that. I, I teach my kids how to do well, my kids are all your age now, but I taught my grandkids how to do that. Right. And so simple things about that. Listen, you know, when you walk around your house, you know, the creaks and the snaps and the pops that you hear, you know exactly where those are. So those are the types of things that I listen for when I first get up. Where is my stuff going this morning? What am I going to do? Do I have at least a half a tank of fuel in, in my car before I go somewhere? Do I have a couple of jugs of water in the back? I call it my pioneer kit. Do I have a couple of blankets? Dude, I live in Colorado up in the middle of nowhere. If I get a flat tire, it could be a death sentence. So those are the types of things where you just, and I call it take a knee. You can sit at the kitchen table. You can sit across from your kids or somebody else's kids as long as they allow it. Eh? Uh, but the idea is that when you're in that moment, you say what's important. It's like Heimlich maneuver. Uh, a dude asked me the other day, what should we rehearse before we go to a restaurant? And they were all high spun, which is hyper vigilant. We'll sit here with our back to the door and count everybody in the room. My thing is, when's the last time you practiced a Heimlich maneuver? You're much more likely to save somebody choking in that room than you are having to fight your way out like some secret squirrel. So the idea is perspective. And increasing your people use situation awareness wrong all the time. You must be more situationally aware. Okay, then put this away. Because yeah. every time I'm in an airport or on a plane, the person couldn't tell me who's sitting next to him. So I like to play games with people. And, and if you're anywhere near me in an elevator or in a mall or at a restaurant, I'm constantly playing games with people to make them pay attention. And, and that takes its toll because people laugh or they're sad and I get a lot of tears and stuff. But the idea is it's unforgettable and they're not going to make that mistake the next time. The, the most recent was in Target in Virginia and the woman was completely checked out. She had a long line of people and everything else. And Brian Marin was standing behind me. We're both wearing the mask. And I said, ma'am, I have no idea who this guy is behind me. He's making me uncomfortable. And she stopped and she completely freaked out. And you could see the histamine response her biometrics. Now pinpoint pupil, she's blushing. She's looking around and I go, calm down. This is part of an experiment. We're both friends. We both showed him our ID. And I said, now, how do you feel right now? Wouldn't it have been good that you would have felt that way before something would have happened? And, you know, she might be a little pissed, but we had a little school circle of people around us and they go, oh, that was good. And we got an applause before we walked out. Look, there are people that will do you harm. And if you're not paying attention, you could easily become a, in the V column and the victims. You know, how, how did a guy in Boulder, Colorado, walk from the parking lot with a gun into a store? Now, in Colorado, everybody's got dope and everybody's got a gun. But there was something different there and everybody missed it and people died. So all we're saying is that all you have to do is take a look around you a few times a day and you'll be so much more aware of your surroundings and you're not going to fall for the crap all the time. Well, let's let's talk about the the Boulder, Colorado situation. Let's just say that uh, you were in that store uh, during that time, and that person walks in. What 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 would you have done, or what should have they have done in that situation? Yeah, and 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 here's my thing. I'm never going to make money uh, scaring people or second guessing people. And I'll tell you right now, if if Alyssa, the guy that was firing the rounds, 
uh, if he was going to hit me, it would have been in the ass because I would have been climbing over people to get out of there. I am not one that sticks around. I am one. I'm a runner and an ostrich. I'll go hide somewhere uh, while I'm dialing 911. But my thing is denial is a strong, harsh mistress. So people that were in that store were hearing pop, pop, pop. And they were going to, well, that might be a car backfiring. Hey, you don't hear uh, balloons pop in a, in a store very often. The thing is, if you don't have training, and I'm not talking education, education is a plaque. You know, here, here, here's one that I got while I was, you know, going through the airport and the person hands me this thing and I'm glad to read it, but that's education. It tells me about something. Training says, listen, when you hear these loud noises, the very first thing that you need to do is start looking for an exit. And if you're looking for an exit at bang, you're likely not going to find one and it's going to go nowhere and then you're going to be in trouble. So drive around the store, walk around the store, become familiar with your local store. The next thing is look at the parking lot for a minute. Is it a busy day? Is it a holiday? Look, Easter, Palm Sunday, Palm Sunday, a couple that just got married, walked into a church and detonated. Bomb vests are heavy. They're bulky. What do they look like? What, uh, what is he doing in his car just before he goes in? And, and, and I'll fault uh, uh, anybody before he pulled into the parking lot because his family was together and they knew that he had problems and he had anger issues and he was playing with the gun at the kitchen table, you know, uh, days and then hours before he went into that place. What's your family like? I, I lived in the most violent place on the face of the planet and spent 40 years in kill zones all over the world. And, you know, it's unusual to have a gun at your kitchen table. Who did they call? Who did they tell? So there's so many of those things. And parents, listen, you don't have to be scared when you go out, go shop and enjoy yourself, go to the mall, do all those things. But listen, rehearse with your kids. If mom says we got to go, we got to go. It's no time to dick around, have rehearsals. Do you do a fire drill at a school? Do you do a fire drill at your own house? Of course you do. So why wouldn't you do an active shooter drill? And it's better for my kid to get scared at home when I could take any and explain it to him than when we're in the parking lot of someplace and I got my a thumb stuck in a sucking chest hold. And I'm trying to yell, you know, to other people what to do. My thing is, it's all got to be predictive. It's got, it's all got to be proactive because in the moment it's a roll of the dice and, and life is very fickle on, on who wins and who doesn't, no matter what you're training. Hey, let's talk about Aurora. You had a cop that had 13, 14 years of the best training in the world. He had the best equipment in the world. He had a, a vest and a gun and the best training in the world. And he got hit in the head and he was out of the game. Is that what we're going to do? Are we going to trade bad guys for cops now? I don't think so. So everybody in the community has to do their part to keep all of us safer. And that's looking around. That's putting your phone away. When you're driving, drive. When you're walking, walk. You know what I'm saying? When you're shopping, shop. But before you do those things, look around. Smell and look and feel and taste your environment. Because anomalies, those things that, that stick out of the crowd, uh, they're incongruent and incongruent things. That's why it's called pattern recognition analysis. Incongruent things stick out to your mind. What about a discordant note uh, during a song? Oh, we hear that all the time. What about when we go to our kid and they're singing the Damu Doris from the Grinch on Christmas and we hear our kid bellow out, you know, we know that right away, don't we? Well, society is like that and human beings are like that. And when we hear the wrong signals, we have to take note. We have to attend. That's where attention comes from. We have to attend to those things. There's so many important things that you touched on in there, like the, the absence of normal. That, that's what we teach a lot of. It's like really picking up on something that is not normal behavior for the context of the situation. But then all that preparation that it does take, to, you right. have to talk about these things. My daughter and I have code words when stuff hits the fan. It's like she knows when I say this that I need to pay attention and it's time to get somewhere. You know, and, and I'll run her through those things. Like if, if her, if it's just her and I eating in a restaurant and I'm like, Hey, I have to go to the bathroom real quick. I said, what would you do right now? If a bad guy came in, she's like, well, I'd, I'd hide under the table. I said, okay, well, that's an option. What other options do you have? She's like, I'd run to the bathroom where you're at. I'm like, that's great too. You know? And so working through those things, not to scare her, but to make her aware of stuff. Yep. And Every single time I've done those interviews, and, and like a 15, six in the military where soldiers died and I have to go in and pick up the pieces or a criminal investigation for a homicide, Justin, when we talk to the people, they go, well, I should have known, or, well, I saw that and I knew that stuck out or, well, mm -hmm. all of these things were present and I was going, man, this ain't right. So, you know, the problem is that we've ordered a number seven super size in a clown's mouth for so long that it's been a long time flash to bang. It's been a long time since we were scared out of our butt. And, and sometimes I, again, I will not sell a course with fear, 
But sometimes all you got to do is watch the evening news to be scared enough to say, hey, when's the next course? And, and it doesn't take much, does it? Your daughter learns incrementally, doesn't she? You don't have to sit down and have a 15-week basic training academy with your kids because they won't do it and they'll resent you. Yeah. And, and, but like you said as well, taking the, these teaching moments, right. And, and, and taking those moments where it's like, Hey, what did you see here? What did you see that was different? Th there was a situation where I am 95% sure that we were about to get mugged in the right. middle of the day coming out of a Walgreens. And we, we were able to defuse a situation, throw her in the car and leave. She's screaming that she's not in a seatbelt yet. And I'm like, hey, there's some bad guys. We got to go. We leave. Kind of did a debrief with her afterwards. I'm like, well, did you see those two guys? Describe them to me. And she was the best witness I've ever talked to in my whole career. There she described the, the color of their skin to their beanies, to what their hair looked like, to what they were wearing. I was like, where, where, where are those type of witnesses when I, when I need to investigate something? Yep. But practicing that stuff with her and making it okay to like hey pay attention to the surroundings and be able to, to do that recall um like you said it's incremental you, you can't absolutely <laughs> you can't do it all at once right listen we're intimidated into not acting sometime we think the coppers are going to get there in time we think emergency mm. service is only a few minutes away we see the sign that says don't press this exit because an alarm will sound we certainly don't want to piss anybody off i'll tell you what if there's a shooting and I'm in the place, that cart with all the cans is going through a window. I'm climbing my fat ass out the window and I'll be screaming all the way down the road. Listen, that's part of it, isn't it? Yeah. We each have our role to do. And so my scared pacifist role is going to be, you know, drawing attention to place by running and screaming. But but there's people that are so busy looking for that that parking spot. They're so busy texting somebody. You got to stop that. When you're out in the world, you're either going to be out in the world or the world's going to be all up in you. So you have to decide that. And the only benefit I think that I've had is, is that I've lived longer than most people. And I've had crappy experiences since I was single digits and I lived through them. So all of that scar tissue adds up to become stories, you know, and, and those stories, the storytelling is the oldest way of transmitting information to our peers. You know, we, we do it uh, in, with a cave painting, right? Uh, we do it where I, I put on the fake horns and uh, Brian will grab the spear and we'll make a fire in the cave and we'll dance around in the shadows to act out what we're about to do. That's all we're saying that you need to do with your family. Where are you going tonight? Have you done this? Have you considered that? Uh, for example, if your kids are going to play on a football team or you're going to a soccer match and it's in a different town, where's the closest level one trauma center? If you don't know where that is, don't go. And you're going, well, why would I need that? Well, if you're asking me that question, you need to back up and find out what that is and what they do at your local emergency room and what the travel time is. Because if one of your kids or your loved ones are injured and you can't get there in time, that might be a thing that you're not willing to expect or accept rather. So all you have to do is plot it out. We tell people, uh, where are you going to get gas? Well, if you can't get gas there, where's your backup point? Why? Because gas stations are wicked dangerous places. The first place that you come off of a, a, a highway or an intersection is normally where the dopers and the LMA and the Mexican mafia and all the other people that we used to be chasing around all the time, they're doing their deals. So they're there gathered up with an Uzi and they've got automatic weapons in the cars and a uh, million dollars to buy, you know, uh, 10 pounds or whatever else. And they're not looking for trouble. But if that spins out of control and you're walking into the uh, daily dozen donuts or something like that, it's going to be a massacre and it's going to be a body count. We don't think about those things. And, and I'm not saying being hypervigilant. I'm not saying not go. I, I love me a good donut. I'm just saying have a plan. You know, we call it the PACE plan, primary, alternate, contingent, and emergent. Primary plan, I'm going to Dunkin' Donuts. Uh, my alternate plan, if it's not open, I'm going to the daily dozen. It's funny how my life is all about fat ramps, right? <laughs> my contingent plan, if neither of those works, I'm going to the 7-Eleven and getting some fig Newtons, right? And, and my emergent plan is, hey, I'm going to make breakfast at home because it looks a little sketchy out in Zompok land today. It's okay to do that. And, and it's all a balance of this is what I'm willing to accept. So I'm willing to accept to go to that part of town and have breakfast, lunch, or dinner. Uh, this is what I'm willing to accept. So I'm going to go to this movie theater. And all I'm telling you, do a little surveillance, do a little research, and it's fun to do those things anyway, and then rehearse before you go. You rehearse before you go, you're going to have a great outing, and even if the crap hits the fan, you're likely going to be a survivor and, and uh, go, wow, that was a close one. And all those, wow, that was a close one moments are what add up 
to create the rich tapestry of life we all enjoy. And it adds to those pattern recognitions, right? When you've seen that that pattern of behavior, when you see, oh, well, we got out of this, you know, but what were they doing? They had their hands in their yep. pockets. They're wearing a hoodie when it's warm outside. Like this is what was going on. Um, something that came to mind, Paul, you, you, you're going to remember this. Like I used to give Paul crap when we'd be out and he wouldn't address, like if, if there was homeless people walking up to us asking for money. I think this is something that's really prevalent out there that people want to ignore them and just walk by and be like, oh, I'm not going to pay attention to them. And I know Paul has changed it since then, because we've had a couple of conversations about it. But it's like, address somebody that's walking up to you, a stranger that's walking up to you, look them in the eye, say something assertively to them, like, hey, buddy, no, I don't have any money for you. Good luck. Right. And, and, and move on your way. Basically, yep. putting a big sign around your neck that says, I'm not a victim. <laughs> yeah. Justin Mines, sorry, not today. Oh. And uh, I address them and everybody should have their own. Okay. Because it's sorry, man, not today. And that lets them know that you've acknowledged them. They'll mm -hmm. stop right there because listen, if they're truly a, a homeless person that needs money, they're not going to invest one iota more of calories. They're going to go to the next person sure. to increase their likelihood. They may have to hit 15, 16 people to make it. The other thing is access. A bad guy needs access. Uh, uh, if, if you come close enough that I can touch you, I can kill you. Uh, I don't carry a gun. Don't worry, I'll, I'll, I'll get yours if I need it, eh? And the idea is, though, that that doesn't come, those bold statements from me being uh, this guy that walks around like a wuss. I project the image, leave me alone, okay? If you're coming up on me, I'm going to orient towards you and go, not today, buddy. Mm -hmm. And when the person says that and they keep coming, well, guess what? Then you're demonstrating intent, and I need to demonstrate my intent right back at you. I never want to get there. Again, I'm a lover, not a fighter. But I got to do that calculus before that person gets too close. And most people want to have their say not their way so if you let them have their say hey f you pal you know that's them to you and you're going hey sorry buddy don't get angry okay anger is a normal human emotion but don't get angry don't get down what did you say to me because that's how you get ganked you you know the, the 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 first the last few words people say before they get shot in the head are and another thing right so you want to be that guy the thing is Human behavior pattern recognition, okay? And I invented all these terms. So if you want to look at the etymology and go back in the history, so I kind of know a little about what I'm talking about to, to most people. So human behavior pattern recognition is you recognizing that that pattern is consistent with a person that would want to gain an, you know, access and injure you. But most people don't want to injure you. They're the mm -hmm. most likely course of action. So the analysis is on you, what's happening in this moment person's got the fake gas can they're going oh buddy i'm a catholic uh, help me out on the weekend or whatever their their thing is yeah not today i'm sorry uh on an airplane i get encroachers all the time because there's that evil middle seat you know what i'm saying and and so i'm a big guy and i gotta pee every 15 minutes on a plane so i'm always aisle guy so that means that people in the aisle are smacking me with all their luggage and now this guy wants to talk to me I don't hear very well. I have to have a magnified hearing when I'm on there. And I certainly don't like to talk to people uh, uh, when I'm not either getting paid for it or having fun, right? So when they start gabbing right away, I look at them and I go, hey, I'm sorry, I don't speak English. Takes them about five minutes. Then they figure out, wow, that was a dick move. And they don't talk to me the rest of the flight. I'm not trying to be rude. I'm just trying to lay the cards out there. I'm just trying to be a transparent, good human. You know, and, and I will not give anybody a handout but I'll give my hand up. That's just me. So if more people were honest and laid that out, I think more people would appreciate them for their honesty. So let's go full circle a little bit here with your kids. Did they, do they have that ability or did they have that ability that you did or because they grew up in a different environment, they didn't need to establish that. I'm sure they have it now, but how did, how did, what was your upbringing with them? So uh, without, without doing my kids ugly and telling you, where they're located and what streets and everything. Cause you know, my address, my home number, everything is on my of business course, yeah. card and has been for 50 years. Right. But, but uh, uh, my daughter uh, is days away from being a PhD in education. She's devoted her entire life to special education and education in, in uh, collegiate uh, 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 forms, you know, in another part of the country. I'm hugely proud of her. Uh, how she reads human beings is a large reason for how she got there. Uh, my son is a paramedic. Uh, um, in addition to being a paramedic, he's a fireman. Uh, we're in a small community, so he's a volunteer at both of those. And he's got a job where he has to read human beings and be in their houses every day. And so that private job that he has 
He consistently tells me how he was able to tell things were going to happen before they went wrong. You don't have to be a captain of industry. You don't have to be going into, you know, triage at the emergency room. You could just be a normal person. And it's much more fun being in on a joke than finding out that you're the butt of the joke later. And it doesn't take much money or much time to get there. I like that. Oh, but, hey. And I must add, I must add this, uh, Paul, uh, my wife, Shelly, who's also our CEO, the best human behavior profile in the world. So our poor children uh, grew up with two human behavior profilers as parents. Can you imagine them? Yeah. So they were going deep that uh, all the time. They didn't get away with crap. It's, it's funny. It, you don't want to use it on your spouse, you know, the, right. these tips and tricks, but like using your kids is completely free game. Oh, yeah. um, my daughter will gladly tell people that I read her mind, you know, even though she's like, yeah, <laughs> it's it though, isn't it? Right. Yeah. It's, it's fun though, but it, it teaches them, you know, certain things and picking up on other people and, and, and looking at the context of the situation. And it, there's nothing else out there teaching that, you know, other no, than, there is than no. hard times. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, so, so let's save a life today. Okay. I'm, I, I've spent my entire life trying to tell other people, this isn't that hard. If I can do it, anybody can do it. Let's save a life. Uh, you got a kid that's going through driver's training. The kid's young. They don't have their license yet, or they just got their license. If your kid's alone in the car, okay, that's all right. Uh, as a matter of fact, if your kid's alone with you in the car, that's a lot better because the more time you spend with them, the better driver they're going to be. They're going to be able to adjust to situations, but that's not for everybody. If your kid has another kid in the car and that kid's anywhere around their age, they're, and I don't know numbers, but 10, 50, 16 times more likely to get in trouble. Now, mm -hmm. if they're also listening to serious uh, rock channel and it's above normal decibel levels, that number is exponentially going to grow. If they got another kid in the backseat, you're looking at what might be a death sentence. So if mm -hmm. we know that, and you can stop that right away, or at least sit down with your kid and go, you're not going to think this is an emergency, but take a look at how quickly this progresses. Uh, listen, there's kids that'll go out and they're going to damage a mailbox, or they're going to put the steaming bag of crap on a porch. They're going to, they're going to do something stupid and they're going to shoplift or steal a, a, a something out of a car. And then the homeowner is going to come out and the porch lights are going to come on. And the first thing that's going to come to their mind is we all have to jump in this car and squeal and flee away. You got to talk to your kids about that. Look, give up. I will get you out of jail. It's nothing big. I can get, get by on that because if you do flee, cops are going to chase you. You're going to spin out of control and kill everybody in the car. Those are things that happen every day. And when you look back at it, you could have prevented it with 15 minutes a week, just having a meal with your kid. And if you can't afford a meal with your kid, just sit with them for a minute and go over some of the plethora of examples that you could create what's happening. You're not trying to scare your kid. You're saying, Timmy, red and blues are going to come on. You've had a drink. I don't want you to have a drink, but you did. You know what? Pull over. We will spin a wheel and make this work. The idea is that if I have choices, even though I made bad choices in my life, somebody came along and showed me good choices. And I go, are you serious? I can, I can do that good choice. Yeah. And it's going to hurt a little. You're going to have to go in the military. You're going to have to buy back your time. You're going to have to do these things, but you know what? Look at where I am now. I've got a cool house. Rogue Manor West is cool. I got this cool Walmart jacket in size five X. I'm talking to you cool guys. So there's a way out of it. And as long as you have those choices, parents, uh, significant others, then your kids will, will have outreach. If not throw the dice, cause they're going to reap the whirlwind. I think that's that's so important. And and whether it's that specific scenario or just just understanding we can talk to our kids and, yep. and give them those ideas, teach teach them how to think, not yep. what to think, but how no, to you're think. Exactly right. And and, yeah. and 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 you know I threw two out there that are just off the top of my sure. immense head. Okay, so we know kids get shot every day finding a gun in, in dad or mom's dresser or, or or they they know where a gun is because somebody stashed it because it's near a dope house or something and what do they want to do it's just like the what, what is it uh, stand by me the stephen king uh, wrote about it. hey you want to see a dead body no you don't and you don't want to see a gun and if you don't talk to your kids about it they may do the 1980 clash hit should i stay or should i go and we don't want that we want them to have the best information. You want your kids to have the best food or the best school or the best car. So why wouldn't you want them to have the best, most available information? And that doesn't cost a penny. That just means that you are willing to intervene in their life and, and have those hard conversations with them. Yeah. No, I think that's so important. And, and, and for all the parents out there listening, hopefully they got some great insight in there to the conversations that they can have. So Greg, what's the best way for people that are listening or watching right now to reach out to you and, and, and check out your content, man. So you understand 
that I was from Detroit, but now I'm in Gunnison, a very small town. And here, my official title is Village Idiot. So <laughs> Marin knows all about Spotify and all these other things. And I know the left of Greg is on all those uh, uh, different cool things. And it's left, like left turn of Greg, me. Uh, and you can look up that podcast anywhere, I'm sure. Uh, uh, but if you can't, do me a favor, write Brian, because he's clearly the brains of the outfit, at Arcadia cognorati.com and it's one word arcadia a-r-c-a-d-i-a no space cognorati c-o-g-n-e-r-a-t-i.com they'll take you right to the website and you can learn all the free stuff we got podcasts and lessons learned and a whole bunch of stuff that are on there that they can utilize today perfect and what are, what's like the next big project you guys are working on like what is what's going on with the Ar- arcadia cognorati right now so what's cool is you know that we've got the uh, free webinar series and we've got the podcast which is fun and the lessons learned are free but we've still continued to uh, do in-person training so we got three or five or seven or 10 or 22 day events that are going on uh, we've got one that's coming up uh, in Colorado right soon uh, please look at it Brian always is cool puts that up on the site uh, we've got two that are coming up overseas uh, we've got one on the west coast and we do what's called a regional training approach so when we're in your region come see us and, mm-hmm. and if you're from a uh, a school or a church school or a venue that's in that region and you can't afford it call brian we'll make time to come out and see you you guys need to come down to texas man we need to we need to get that figured out you guys need to come i am here. ready to go and listen we've done it for everything that you guys say hey uh we got a couple of cots in the garage and we'll spring for the flight <laughs> listen nothing is out of the question obviously we got to get paid by the people that can afford it but we'd love to come to your community and show them there's a better way and that you don't have to walk around hyper alert and scared of your surroundings all day Awesome. That's amazing, Greg. Well, we like to wrap up the show with the uh, idea of the the name of our podcast in mind, Actions and Limits, right. and ask these questions. What would you say is the number one action that people out there can take that can make a huge difference in their lives right now? That's great. That would be communication. Improve your communication by listening to your kids. Listen to what they got to say, because if you're not listening, somebody else at school will be. Now, those listening skills are so important. And the other side of that are these self-imposed limits that we place on ourselves. And I'm sure you've seen that. What would you say is the most prevalent limit that people place on themselves that we need to get rid of? Yeah. So embrace the U.S. Constitution, embrace your originality and embrace transparency. Somebody will tell you out there that there's a glass ceiling here or because of your color, because of your age, or because of who you pray to or you choose not to pray to, that that's going to be a limiting factor. They're going to say the job stopper tattoos on your knuckles are going to define you. You're not defined until you define yourself, and you're not done until you tap out. Wow. Wow. What, what a powerful message that, to end the show on, Greg. Thank you for that. So, Greg, thank you so much for coming on the show. I'm glad that you were able to come on the show You know, right after Brian was able to come on the show, get you guys together, two different perspectives on the same mission that you guys are putting out there. So, Greg, thank you so much for coming on the show, brother. I'm honored. Paul, Justin, thanks so much. Hope to be on sometime again. Wow, Paul. Greg was such a great guest. Um, little different personality than Brian come on the show, but talking about, you know, the, the, the same insight on, on human behavior. So, you know, that that's my jam. Uh, what was your biggest takeaway from what Greg shared? You know, a lot of the stuff he's talking about is, is kind of uncomfortable, but necessary. You know, it, it's hard to even, you know, think about the worst case scenario because you don't want, you don't want your mind to go over there. But it's necessary, especially if you have a family and, and your own self when you're out and about in different situations that you're not aware of. So it's it's good to be able to pick up on cues that are not right. That way you're prepared. If something were to go awry, you know what you need to be doing. Yeah, and I think that you um, described it perfectly. It is uncomfortable for people to to go there and think about those things. And and, and I know that the Greg was making it a point that we don't want everyone to be hyper vigilant because that it does take a stress out on you, but there are certain situations where it's like, Hey, this situation we're in right now, this context we're in, it's a little bit more dangerous than our you know normal situation. So, you know, I need to be more aware of the situation, whether it's more people or you're in an unfamiliar location. Um, but but again, he, Greg touched on it. He said that, you know, that denial 
we love to deny things that are, oh, oh, that guy's not going to do something bad to me and my family. Oh, I'm just being paranoid or, oh, that's not what I think it is. No, we need to pay attention to when we pick up on this stuff because our subconscious is always picking up on this, th these patterns of behavior and abnormal behavior that is happening around us but we like to deny it, but it, it, it really can save a life, you know, your life, your family's life. Um, but I will, I will tell everyone listening from, from firsthand experience, it is stressful to, to live in a state of, of hypervigilance. And it, you have to find a way to balance that out to where you're not expecting the worst to happen in every situation you're in, but to be aware put your phone down, look around at your surroundings and pay attention. So, but um, it definitely could be something that could save somebody's life. 100%. Yeah. Well, let's go ahead and wrap up the show with another segment of ask Paul anything. Uh, make, make sure to continue to send your questions into actions and limits at gmail.com to get your question featured on the show. Um, I thought this one was interesting. So I pulled this out of our email, Paul. This is from Len in Nebraska. And he says, what would be the worst thing for the government to make illegal? The worst thing to make the government illegal is laughter. <laughs> I don't, wouldn't want to live in a world where I could not laugh, where everything is serious all the time it would be horrible and i don't think i'm alone there i think a lot of people would feel the same way that every day you had to stand at attention and walk to work or drive to work and everything's serious all the time so laughter would be criminal if the government got rid of that they're they're slowly getting rid of just comedy in general just uh, making everything pc but no Making laughter illegal. Yeah, that would be that would be a little harsh. It'd be a little hard to enforce as well. But uh, no, I like that. So, man, another great show, Paul. I'm glad that we were able to have Greg on the show as well to um, get another perspective on what him and Brian are are accomplishing with their business. So, uh, you know, a little bit different personality. Got to see some different perspective on it. So, I was really glad that we that we were able to get Greg on the show, man. Absolutely. For Justin Atherton, this is Paul Fortune. We'll see you next week. All right. See you next Monday. Thank you for listening to the show. Don't miss an episode. Click and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Follow us on your favorite podcast platform and find us on Instagram and Facebook under Actions and Limits to stay updated on all our upcoming content. Continue to email the show at actionsandlimits at gmail.com for our segment Ask Paul Anything. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next week.